Hello, and welcome to Little Rock Original Free Will Baptist Church. I am Jerry Godwin, and we will be bringing you the Sunday School lesson today entitled, Bringing Us Close. It's taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and Psalm 111. Um, <laughs> Psalm 111. And we are, we are glad to have you, and we encourage you to listen every uh, week and join us in sharing the word. And uh, I have to point this out. I mean, there's people from all over uh, the country and all over the world, but we got one viewer from France, and I just want to say a personal hello to you, and uh, bonjour, I guess that's the word, and hope you enjoy the lesson, and we're so glad to have you and share it with your, your friends. Um, today's lesson is the most important thing about today's lesson is what you, I will not say, and you will not hear. It will be what I don't say, and you will not hear, but I hope you grasp what I'm not saying. Paul had been to Corinth which was a ma major metropolitan seaport city on the isthmus. And yes, they always sing, we wish you a merry isthmus. And it was a, um, a, tip a stereotypical seaport town where um, there is a lot of activity, a lot of culture, a lot of educational opportunities, but at the same time, a, an opportunity for sinning and mischief. And Paul had left to go to Antioch um, in, in Jerusalem and Galatia, and Chloe and her people had written a letter to Paul about some concerns in the church. And you have to remember, this is a first century church, and they have to decide what are the things that are allowed and the things that are not allowed. And some of the Christians, Corinth Christians, also wrote to Paul. So the, today's lesson is his response. Now, what was going on in the concern in the day's lesson is the church's ability or inability or their being allowed or prohibited from eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Now you're saying, rightfully so, as I did, and I have a tendency to say things that are funny. Sometimes it's only funny to me, but other times people seem to enjoy my humor. So, and you're, you're thinking, what has that got to do with me? I'm not going to eat meat, and if it is, like some of the steak eaters, I only want it well done. <laughs> and the other ones say, well, I only want it medium rare. And the people doing the sacrifices say, we only do well done. So anyway, he says, now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Now, the Christians believed um, they wanted to know if they could eat meat that was used in pagan sacrifices. The Jews, the Jewish people, followed strict dietary laws that forbade them from eating unclean foods. Now, the Jerusalem Council who was sort of like a legislative body 
for the early churches to keep these sort of things straight, um, saying that um, it was okay to eat the food. But so there was this confusion and division. And as we said last week, where the quotes are is what the people are saying. They say here in the Greek philosophical world that all of us possess knowledge. Well, there's nothing wrong with having knowledge. I wish I had some more. And but the, uh, the, the problem that came from this is the Greek philosophers and the Greek uh, students were thinking that their, their knowledge made them more important than other people. In other words, it says that they were puffed up. And in the 13th chapter of Corinthians, it says that love does not puff up. Nothing that we do as a church and as Christians um, should be puffed up um, short of edifying the church itself. Anyone who claims, um, it says knowledge puffs up and love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, Paul says. But anyone who loves God is known by him. And known is that intimate relationship that God has with his people. Now, <clears throat> This commentary said, it is love that builds up the church. Paul is, is not against knowledge. As a matter of fact, Paul was a very educated man for his time, a very educated person for his time, and he was pers personally taught by Gamaliel, who was a known scholar. But his concern is that they have reached a pinnacle of knowledge. Now, there are, I have heard people say, I have reached all the knowledge that I can take. I can't learn anymore. I'm too old to learn. And I'm here to profess and confess um, I, 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 I'm, in, I'm a person that always wants to learn. And then I've been introduced to my, my son's smart TV. And, and, and that's really a misnomer. The TV may be smart, but I as a user am not so. <laughs> I, we, we went to his house and we couldn't even turn the TV on, much less find the channels. So I'm going to have to work on that because um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to get a, quote, smart TV before too long. And Paul was never um, tired of learning. He says, the point is, is not how much one knows, but how much one loves. Let me repeat that. The point is, is not how much one knows, but how much one loves. And we will see that in this conflict. The true measure of maturity in Christ and Christian maturity is found in not knowing God but in God knowing us. To put ourselves in the position for God knowing an intimate relationship, 
with us, his followers. Having settled the underlying problem of spiritual arrogance, Paul addresses the practical issue of eating uh, food sacrificed to idols. They respond, no, there is no idol, no idol in the world really exists. And we know that. They were in this first century in this um, um, poly, uh, the, I can't think of the word right now, many, many religions, many religions. Um, they are still, many of them are still worshiping idols. And the Christian church and community knows that gods associated with the idols really do not exist. And they also say there is no God but one, and that is God Yahweh, Jehovah, the covenant God. Indeed, indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven and earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. And he goes on and says in verse 7, It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. There are weaker members. And I think we as a church sometimes forget and do not do the things to edify weaker members. Now these weaker members may be new converts to Christianity or they may be older members that have never grown in their faith. But it is our responsibility not to judge them for their lack of knowledge but to edify them by loving them and helping them grow. Since some, some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol. Now, what they're saying here is, is the weaker members, they see the food and they don't see the food as a problem. What they see is the stronger members eating the food. And have you ever seen something that you could not unsee? <laughs> and I think we all have. And that's what they're saying is, we can see that food and we can't, we can't unsee the other members eating this food that is ceremonially unclean for a Christian to eat in their mind. So they lose their faith um, that they have. And it says their conscience being weak is defiled. In the letter, it says, food will not bring us close to God. And <laughs> I was trying to think of some comical uh, thing to say, um, but I really have never known food to bring me closer to God. And there's some food that I really, really like, but it doesn't have a spiritual nature to it. And Paul says, we are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. Food 
does not have, does not bring us closer to God. This is just a ritual, and the food was available um, to the people either directly from the pagan sacrifices or sent to the market for them to buy. And they were confused over this. But he says, But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, in the book of the law, in one of them, in Leviticus, it says, get this now. <laughs> you shall not curse the deaf. You shall not curse those that cannot hear and or put a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear your God, and I am the Lord. Now, last week I actually fell over some boxes um, that I didn't see in my pathway, and I, I planted uh, a face plant, face four. And I was blind because I was carrying something and I couldn't see the boxes. Well, what a cruelty to curse the deaf and put a stumbling block in front of others. And that, was, that is Paul's primary concern here. For if others see you, this, if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating sacrificed to idol, idols? So by your knowledge, the weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed. But when you thus sin against brothers and sisters and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So you see what he's saying, the way we as the strong Christians behave and show the example to our weaker brothers and sisters, we are sinning against them and thus we are sinning against Christ. And I love the way Paul finishes this. He says, Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never again eat meat, so that I'm, I may not cause one of them to fall. You see, Paul is driven by his love and for the edification of the church and the members thereof. Now here is what I'm not going to say. And I didn't. But think about this a, a minute. You may on the surface and simply say, that doesn't concern me. It wouldn't be in the Bible if it didn't concern you and me. My question is what do I or what do you do that simply can become a stumbling block to prevent someone that is new in the faith to not grow. I like to think I am funny, and I actually have been paid to be funny in the past, but if, if it's only, I have learned this, if it's only funny to me, 
it's not funny. And humor is not funny to some people. So my comical words at time can cause um, a detraction for those that don't understand. And there's people that don't understand my humor. Um, also, how about things that we do, we say, we put in print? Just think about some of these avenues. The things we watch on TV, the things we look at on um, social media. Just ask you these questions. Are these for my edification? And is anything from this driven because of my love for others and my love for God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm, I'm not going to read Psalm 111. I will just tell you, it's all about praising God. I give thanks to God for his delivering Israel from Egypt and delivering them from Babylonian capti captivity. Do you praise God for your deliverance? He praises God for their, his wonderful deeds and for his covenant, for his written word, for the law. Are we mindful of that and are we, do we praise God for his eternal love? His praise endures forever. I want to share with you um, this cute little saying that you've heard the phrase the family that prays together stays together this author said the congregation that praises together stays together the congregation that praises together stays together and we should be a church that conjointly praises God when every part of our being and that we love our fellow members and that we love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And I want to close with this reading from the 13th chapter of Corinthians that is, ties all this together in my mind and one of the most beautiful chapters of the Bible. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long, and is kind. Love does not lend, uh, envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up, as we talked about. It does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, 
endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am now known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Amen.